Uh, so, hello, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, today, I would like to share with you some insights from my experience uh, with working with big geodata. So, the story starts with uh, Terragence, which is a UK based company operating in the field of uh, crowdsourcing and network analytics. Uh, and the goal of this exercise was actually to understand the coverage areas of uh, the antennas on the mobile network. So what were the areas uh, covered by the different uh, antennas? And we are particularly interested in the coverage across technology generations, so 2G, 3G, uh, and so on. Uh, what we had in our hands was some crowdsourced data, so uh, a huge data set uh, about mobile usage that has um, interesting uh, properties like the technology type, the technology generation, uh, and obviously the, the lat long coordinates. So, uh, this is uh, a data set for the entire UK. So the idea was to process and analyze uh, this data set. Um, as I mentioned, this is very uh, large data set. So for the O2 operator, uh, we are talking about uh, 100 million points a year. Uh, and the idea was to crunch this data and transform it into useful information. And this is where the other uh, partner comes into play. So EarthPulse is a company specialized in big data and geospatial analytics. So to summarize a bit, uh, the specific problem that we had in hand was uh, actually uh, transforming uh, a huge set of points into a set of discrete surfaces, so polygons. So basically, uh, we wanted to group these points uh, following a certain criteria, which is the, the cell ID. So they, they belong to the same, uh, or they were connected to the same transceiver station and local area code. And then we wanted to define uh, this area, the area that uh, encloses these points. Uh, for the people who work in geospatial analysis, which I believe uh, many of you do, uh, you're probably uh, already thinking of the algorithm that can do this, right? Transforming points into polygons. So there is uh, actually a deterministic algorithm which does exactly that. It's called uh, convex sol, uh, and basically it allows you to ingest a set of points and to define what is the smallest convex set that uh, contains these points that encloses these points. And so, based on this, you can actually uh, transform uh, a set of points into a polygon, which is uh, exactly what we wanted to do. Now we had a small challenge here because we didn't want to use all the points in the data set. So there were actually uh, some outliers, uh, but we had another challenge, which is uh, not all the outliers were invalid. So we wanted to uh, consider some of the outliers. And this is because uh, the measurements can show up sometimes in odd locations because of the behavior of signals uh, around things like water or mountains. So uh, in the example that you see here, uh, you have in the bottom, you see some points that are uh, most likely uh, non-valid, but on the top, you had uh, some points which are in an odd location, so they are uh, far away from the, the main cluster, but this is because uh, they are uh, sitting on the slope of a mountain, and this introduces uh, some distortion uh, in the signal. So we want to uh, consider these points. So how can we distinguish um, the valid outliers from the invalid outliers. So basically, when you have this type of distortion in the signal, it affects uh, many points because it's a pattern. So you will have uh, a bunch of points that are affected by this rather than a single point. So actually what we needed to look at here is uh, density, high density. So we wanted to find uh, the areas that have more density and even in the areas that seem a bit odd, we should look for some density of points. Uh, so I'm, I think you may also uh, already resonate what is the algorithm that deals with density. Uh, 
uh, it's a clustering algorithm. So basically, if you use density-based clustering, you can uh, define the clusters as the areas of higher density than the remainder. So the points that are uh, between clusters are considered noise, which is uh, what we were looking for. Uh, in particular, there is a clustering algorithm called dbscan, uh, which does not require a predefined number of clusters. So uh, instead, these, uh, the number of clusters is drawn uh, from the data, which is what we were looking for. So our challenge here was uh, to uh, tune the dbscan algorithm, the parameters, so that we could, on one hand, we could exclude the valid outliers, but we could also include the valid outliers. Uh, and we could do this by uh, playing with a, a parameter called mean points, uh, which is uh, the minimum uh, set of points uh, required to initiate the cluster. So based on this, we ca could capture uh, these uh, valid uh, outliers. So we, we run a lot of experiments uh, in QGIS, uh, doing the complete pipeline. So basically uh, running the, the clustering algorithm and then uh, on the results of the, the clustering algorithm running the convex all. Uh, and I think this was a very important step uh, in the entire process because it allowed us to uh, tune, to fine tune the algorithm parameters in an environment that is very friendly. So you have uh, some degree of interactiveness uh, and you have a map where you can uh, visually inspect your inputs and your outputs so it's very easy to to debug and to understand uh, what is going on. So uh, this was very important in particular for the, the tuning the dbscan algorithms. Uh, the next step was uh, to run this at scale, to, to implement uh, this at scale. Uh, so uh, the idea was, the initial idea was to create uh, an application that can implement this uh, workflow. Uh, but I was not uh, very convinced uh, about holding such a huge amount of data in the, in the memory, in a memory data structure, like an array or so. Uh, so this, this is a bit uh, uh, challenging. Uh, and actually there are uh, tools that are made for uh, exactly for this, for, for managing data and enabling us to uh, just pull the data that we want uh, for a specific query. And you probably think uh, of already what these tools are, these are databases. So the databases are capable of storing data and managing data and we can actually uh, select the data we want and then write and read from the database as we want. Um, so fortunately, uh, PostGIS supports uh, both of the algorithms that we were looking for. So the, the convex hull uh, and the dbscan algorithms are supported in PostGIS. So it's possible to, to implement uh, this complete pipeline in the database. But the, the idea was to automate this. So I, I didn't want necessarily to be uh, pressing a button to, to run one query after the other. So I, I guess uh, one way, one path could be to implement this as a stored procedure or even using uh, a scripting language uh, supported by, by the database. Actually, I decided to go another route and uh, write a Python application that uh, does this. So basically it orchestrates all the jobs uh, that it has that we need to do and basically automates the interaction with the database. That's what it does. Uh, so we, we wrapped both the database and the, the Python application in Docker containers. So we virtualized them and uh, orchestrate them using Docker Compose. Um, you can see the, the architecture uh, in this diagram. It's, it's very simple. So basically uh, all, the, all the workload is being uh, handled by PostGIS. Uh, and the Python application is only uh, the role of orchestrating the, the different calls to, to the database, basically. It's articulating uh, the logic of the, of the application. So uh, the technology stack is 
completely free and open source. So we use uh, Python for the, the application. Um, and then uh, the database is Postgres extended with uh, PostGIS. Uh, and finally, everything was virtualized uh, using Docker. Uh, and the idea was to do this uh, in batch jobs. So to give uh, a, a, a folder with a, a set of a bunch of uh, text files, uh, which were in uh, CSV format, comma separated value format, and then to process uh, one after the other and dump the outputs uh, in, in more text files. So basically like a, a sausage factory where you put the meat and then you see uh, the final product uh, coming afterwards. So to, to summarize for each file, uh, we did this uh, chain of operations. So one step after the other, first we ingest the data into the, the database. Then uh, we do the pre-processing, which involves basically uh, calculating the, the clusters uh, per, per cell ID. And then uh, through this output, we applied the uh, Covexal uh, algorithm. And finally, we dumped the results into a text file. So we wanted the, the results to be user, easily consumed by a, a GIS. So we used the OGC uh, w, WKT format, so well-known text format, which is uh, interoperable. Uh, and I can tell you from all these steps, uh, by far the one that was most uh, consuming, uh, whether in terms of time or in, or in terms of uh, CPU uh, and RAM, was the, the clustering algorithm. So this is where most of the work, uh, of the workload was. Uh, the others were uh, re relatively uh, quick. So we wanted to, at this stage, I was running this uh, in my laptop and I have to say it, it ran perfectly, but we wanted to do this at scale. So we, we had a lot of files uh, and I think most important that we, we want more power, powerful machines, but we wanted to be able to parallelize jobs. So we wanted to run uh, this for a bunch of uh, different files at the same time. So we created uh, some EC2 machines on AWS Initially, they, they were not uh, super powerful. So we're talking about 16 gigabytes of RAM. And in the end, we were using uh, more powerful machines uh, with up to eight cores and 32 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, and with this final setup, uh, the entire uh, uh, batch of jobs took less than two hours. So for the, the entire UK. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, before arriving to this point, we run it many and many times because we, we had to uh, fix some things, uh, also do different tweaks. So we did lots and lots of runs. And this is where I find that it was really useful to use the, to virtualize the, the application because uh, it made it really easy to deploy uh, every time to deploy the system in a new server. So we could, virt we could launch a server in Amazon and in a matter of seconds, uh, we were running the, the entire application. So there was no need to install uh, Python packages or install the Postgres database and Postgres and configure uh, nothing. It was really, really quick and this made it easy to do uh, lots of uh, runs. So the results, as I told you, uh, we, we ran this for the O2 network, so it was around uh, 100 million points for the entire UK. Uh, and these were covering different local ARI codes uh, for the different technology generations. So you can see that for 3G, there were 1,212 uh, local ARI codes. Uh, and in average, each local ARI code could have around 500 to 700 uh, cell IDs, although some larger local area codes could have as much as uh, 2,000 uh, cell IDs. And uh, now this is also uh, operational as an API. So you can actually uh, contact uh, uh, an API and uh, ask, uh, so give the, the different parameters, the local area codes, uh, technology and so on, and uh, on demand, 
you will receive uh, the, the polygons that uh, represent uh, the coverage area. Um, so this is uh, a slightly different uh, implementation of, in terms of technology, so it's not using the, the same stack uh, that we use for uh, this initial implementation, but the concepts uh, are exactly the same. So it's doing the, the clustering to select the points and then uh, evaluating the, the convex hulls. So this is probably the, the most interesting part of the talk. So the, I think there were a lo lot of lessons learned uh, by processing these. Uh, first of all, I learned that uh, when you have a memory box, uh, they, uh, when you are uh, working at this scale, uh, in each iteration, uh, it's eating, uh, if it's eating a small amount of memory, this can grow to a point that ends up eating all the RAM memory of the machine. Uh, now, fortunately, we were using uh, Docker containers, so there was some degree of isolation, so the, the worst case scenario would be to actually uh, crash the container, so it couldn't affect the host. Uh, but still, I mean, it's, it's a process that is, uh, uh, it's very painful. And if you are running these on directly on the host, you may end up uh, crashing your machine. Uh, so, a, I, I, I also have to say that if you do even a small tweak, it can have a, a great impact in the performance from, for the same reason. So, if it's a small tweak, but you are running this small tweak over multiple uh, iterations, then you will save, it will have a lot of, of impact in the, in the final run. Uh, I told you that the, the process that was more costly was the, the clustering. So we created some rules uh, to say that we could uh, avoid clustering in some areas that didn't have uh, certain, didn't meet certain requirements like uh, a minimum number of points, for instance. And this would save us uh, actually a lot of time and a lot of processing because we didn't have to uh, run this particular uh, algorithm. So I would say that uh, bulk processing is, uh, involves a delicate balance. So in one hand, we want to run uh, batch jobs because uh, what we want to do is decrease the amount of human intervention. But on the other hand, this also decreases our chance of intervention in case of errors. So uh, if we have a problem, then maybe we lose uh, every, all the work we did uh, in this run. So it's actually a, a delicate balance. So we want to uh, automate, automate a lot, but not automate uh, too much. Uh, and in the, in the case of problems, I think it's very relevant. Uh, at least I, I, I learned to have this attitude of uh, being very paranoid and uh, monitor everything, log as much as we can, uh, so that we can pinpoint uh, uh, exactly what were the conditions that caused this particular problem? Was it something uh, in the data or was it a bug in the application? So uh, it's very important in order to go back and try to understand uh, what is going on. Uh, another thing that I found uh, relevant was to log also the time that each operation was taking uh, in case to, to, that help us to you know, detect some problems if uh, a particular piece of code was was taking too long or longer than expected. And, and of course, uh, to monitor also the hardware. So especially for uh, bugs that involve memory, uh, I think it's very relevant to monitor the RAM usage or, or, or the CPU uh, usage. And during the process, uh, all we have is are the logs. Uh, this is the only way that we have to understand what is going on. So in a process this is taking hours, uh, we don't want to be waiting, staring uh, at the blank screen. So the logs are really important. Uh, but when we finish, we can actually uh, grab the outputs and check them in a GIS. And I think this is a very important step, the, the validation of results. Does it look uh, as expected? And even to compare it uh, with an experiment that is run uh, in, a, in a GIS to see if the results uh, match. So th this is a very important uh, step, I think, uh, in this pipeline. 
And I, I already told you that uh, we did some, a lot of experiments in uh, QGIS. We also did some small scale experiments, but unfortunately, uh, it's not until you start running with a large data set that many problems uh, start to happen. So whether it's because of the volume of data that was not before and can trigger some, uh, some um, for instance, some memory uh, errors, or whether it's because of the diversity of situations that if you have a small uh, data set, you cannot capture uh, the diversity of situations that you have in the in the whole data set. So uh, unfortunately, there is some degree of debugging that needs to happen also in the large scale experiments, which is not something that we necessarily want to do. Uh, but uh, here again, I mean, if you are using uh, containerization and everything is uh, quite automated, uh, and if there are logs, it doesn't have to be uh, too painful. And to finish, I would like to say that uh, I was very impressed uh, about how well uh, PostGIS performed. Um, of course, there, there were some tool, some operations that were important, like in indexing the, the tables, uh, using special indexes and so on. But overall, uh, it, it performed really, really well. And even in an expensive method, uh, SDBSCAN, uh, I think the the result was uh, was very very positive. So uh, thank you very much for for your attention. This this was all from from me. Uh, these are our, our contacts, and uh, if you want to get in touch, and I think we may have time for some questions now. Thank you. Great. Yes, we 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 do have some. We do have a couple of questions. Um, so the first from uh, Fakhar Khalid, who says um, a complex hull creates a polygon with plenty of empty areas. Is there a replacement algorithm that can tightly hug the boundary of the points? Uh, can you rephrase the question? I mean, empty areas? In what sense? Uh, I, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> reading the question. Can uh, I attempt to answer that question? Oh, okay, sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the algorithm that we use is convex hull, which basically draws a fairly naive straight lines around your area. And there are big areas. There is another algorithm, which is, I think, convex hulls, which hugs the border of the points uh, much tighter. Um, but I think it's quite heavy on the processing load. But yeah, you could do convex holes if you wanted to. I don't know if that answered the question, but. I think so. Yeah. The, the other, sorry, could I just add there as well? Um, we, we did something similar for a, a high street um, application where we buffered out and back in again, and that creates the, the effect. But again, that would be quite heavy in terms of processing. Great. Um, and then another a uh, couple of questions from uh, Stefan Keller, who says, "Did you look at uh, paralysed geo pandas as a as a as an alternative option for for doing this?" Uh, no, I mean we decided to do everything in the in the database uh, to actually uh, tackle this challenge of not having to store the data uh, in memory. So. When we saw that the algorithm was available in the database, we did it directly. Uh, but I think for the, the latest implementation, the, the one that is in, uh, the, in the API, uh, the pandas library has been used. Okay. And then Stefan also says, um, what about using Python Jupyter to script in a sort of documented, reproducible sort of way? Um, that could be an option as well. Uh, I think that's uh, so. Do everything uh, the same thing. So instead of using the the Python application, it could be done in, in a notebook. Yes. Cool. Um, and then we've got a question from Emily Selwood, who says, "Do you have any hints around logging across multiple containers?" Uh, 
okay, we, we were logging, uh, we are logging in different, so we were using the, the logging of, uh, of um, OSGIS, the, the logging of the database, and we were also using the logging of the Python application. So I, I guess this is a, a use case where you, you are logging different containers. Uh, when you use Docker Compose, uh, you can actually, uh, you can wire your containers in a way so that they both uh, output uh, the logs. So if you, uh, if you access the Docker Compose logs, you would have the, the logs of every container. Right. Okay. I don't know if this answers the question. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. um, it did, it did. I, I thought it did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, great. Uh, have we got